those, if there are people that need to leave strictly at 12, please feel free to go. We'll run about 10 minutes after that this morning. My name is Christopher Chaiba. I'm a professor of astrophysics and international affairs at Princeton University, and I'm also on the board of trustees of the SETI Institute, which is a private nonprofit in California uh, devoted to the scientific search for extraterrestrial life. It's my honor this morning to introduce Sir Martin Rees, who is the Astronomer Royal of Great Britain, as well as the Master of Trinity College and a world-renowned cosmologist. Our structure this morning will be that I'll make a few brief introductory remarks. Sir Martin will make a lengthier presentation on uh, the fate, on the origin and fate of the universe and the search for life in that universe. And then I'll make a few brief remarks having to do with the search for life in our solar system and on extrasolar planets, and I'll say just a bit about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, our intention is to leave most of our time open for all of you for questions and comments. So if I, if I may begin, uh, by way of introduction, I simply want to talk briefly about this word life. Our panel, uh, our session is titled The Fate of the Universe and the Search for Life. Well, so what is it? I think it's, it makes sense for us to spend just a moment talking about what it is we're searching for. And the fact of the matter is there's no good answer to that question. There is no scientifically agreed definition to the word life. And the philosopher Carol Cleland and I have recently argued that that's not a surprise. It's not surprising that scientists haven't been able to give a definition for what it is we're looking for. Uh, Carol and I have argued that, in fact, currently with respect to life, we're in a situation analogous to the situation Leonardo da Vinci was in centuries ago when in the Arundel Codex he tried to explain what water is. And if you read, I don't happen to read archaic Italian, but if you read in translation Leonardo's discussion, you'll see that he's wrestling with the many different aspects of water. Sometimes it's muddy, sometimes it's sweet, sometimes it's salty, it can be green, it can be brown, it can be yellow. Very difficult for Leonardo to explain just what water is, even though it's something we see around us every day. And that even leaves aside the fact that it can be a gas or it can be a solid. In retrospect, Leonardo could not have given a good definition for water, because he was trying to explain what water was prior to any knowledge of what atoms are or what molecules are. Several centuries later, once we had a theory of molecules, we can say exactly what water is. Water is H2O. No ambiguity. We can identify it exactly. And that also helps to explain the differences among muddy water and salty water and so on. We're in a situation currently with respect to life that's analogous to the situation Leonardo was in with respect to water. There is no general theory of life. And in fact, it's hard to see how there could be such a theory as long as we only have one example of life, the life we know here on Earth, to base such a general theory upon. Therefore, I think what astronomers often do is retreat to a discussion of what's sometimes called life as we know it. We can talk today also about life as we don't know it, about ideas about what other forms of life might be, might be. But much of the search for life, not all of it, but much of the search for life now concerns so-called life as we know it, life based on liquid water, a set of elements, most famously carbon, carbon-based life, and of course, a source of energy. So much of the discussion astronomers have when they look out at the galaxy or they look into our own solar system is not so much a search for life, but a search for environments that could sustain life as we know it. Where is there liquid water in our solar system, for example? What are the regions in our galaxy that could support stars with planets that could have liquid water on them? Because at least those environments could harbor life as we know it. With those introductory remarks, I'll turn the floor over to Sir Martin Rees. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm going to make a few rather disconnected remarks uh, in the hope they'll stimulate uh, some discussion afterwards. Uh, the picture up there is uh, the iconic figure uh, of uh, physical sciences, um, Einstein. Of course, uh, we know him as a benign and unkempt sage, as in that picture. But of course, uh, his great work was done when he didn't look at all like that, but looked more like that. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, so he, he was a young man uh, when he did his great work. And what I want to do is to uh, uh, say how the concept of the universe has changed from his time. Uh, when Einstein did his work, uh, we thought that the entire universe was essentially what we now call the Milky Way, our galaxy. And that's a picture 
of our galaxy, which is a disk of stars that we are embedded in. Now, one thing we have learnt uh, since Einstein's time uh, is that uh, our Milky Way is just one galaxy of many. If you could get 10 mil ten, two billion, no, 2 billion light years away from our galaxy and look back at it, it would look something like this. This is in fact the Andromeda galaxy, a near neighbour of ours, which is a disk galaxy viewed almost edge on, where the stars are all orbiting around some central hub. And we now know that uh, within range of our telescopes there are literally billions of galaxies like this, and our Milky Way is just one of them. And each galaxy contains about a hundred billion stars. That's more stars in each galaxy than there are humans on the Earth. Uh, each star <coughs> being typical of, of something like our sun. And there is also a lot of glowing gas in our galaxy and other galaxies. There is also a lot of uh, mysterious dark material we don't know about, but which we infer is present, because otherwise gravity would not be strong enough to hold it all together. Now, if we look with a very big telescope, we can, of course, see things very faint and very distant. And this amazing picture shows a small patch of sky, a patch of sky that would look almost black, looked at through a small telescope. And this patch of sky is so small, it would take about a hundred patches like it to cover the area of the full moon in the sky. It's just a few arc minutes square. Now, you see in this picture literally hundreds of little smudges. Each of those is a galaxy, fully equal to ours or Andromeda, looking so small and faint because of the immense distance. These galaxies are being seen as they were when they are young, because the light from some of these galaxies has taken 10 billion years to get to us. So we see them when they were very young, uh, when they consist in many cases of pristine gas that hasn't yet had time to turn into stars. We've also learned that in the centres of some galaxies there are black holes. I don't have time to go into these, but uh, in the centre of the galaxy there is some region of space where gravity is so strong that it's cut off from the rest of its surroundings and material swirls down into it, giving rise to some of the most exotic and powerful phenomena in the universe. And black holes, which I can talk about later, are among the most exotic predictions of Einstein's theory, and we now know that they exist uh, in the centres of almost all galaxies. Now, we've learned through a succession of uh, arguments, which I don't have time to go into, a view of how our universe evolved from a dense beginning to its present state over a time of about 13 or 14 billion years. And if we work backwards, uh, we uh, can see those distant galaxies at the time when the universe was about a tenth its present age, when the universe, instead of being about 13 billion years, was a little more than one billion years. We also have some evidence for what the universe was like when it was much, much hotter and denser than it is now, when everything was squeezed together, so that everything now in the universe was squeezed hotter and denser than the centre of the star. And we have evidence for what the conditions were like then. And, in fact, we can trace back with a great deal of confidence to what the universe was like when it was about a millisecond old. It was then at a temperature of about uh, uh, 10 billion degrees um, and uh, uh, much, much denser than ordinary solid. And we believe that everything has expan expanded from that hot, dense state. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a movie to show you of simulations of this, but people have done simulations to show how we can trace things from this amorphous, dense beginning. Now, of course, this just pushes things back so far, and you can always ask questions about what happened before the first millisecond. And here, things are very uncertain. And the reason for that is that the laws of physics that we can study in the lab seem to apply everywhere we can see in the universe. If you analyse the 
spectrum, the light from a distant galaxy, it seems to come from atoms just like the atoms that we see in our lab. So the laws of physics seem to apply everywhere we can see. But if we ask what was the universe like when it was a billionth of a second old, it was then have been so hot and dense that the conditions are outside the range that we can do any experiments on. So we don't know. And so the big mystery of the early universe is that we don't understand the relevant physics. And that's why it's a big challenge. Just to change gear a little bit, um, let me show you this picture, which is one that Einstein would very much have liked. The brighter objects here are the galaxies in a cluster of galaxies about a billion light years away. The fainter smudges are galaxies several times further away still. And what you see is some sort of streaks and arcs. And what's happening in this picture is that <coughs> the material in the in, in this cluster here is converging the light from background objects. So you're seeing the background objects as though through a rather poorly figured converging lens. And just as if you looked at wallpaper with a regular pattern through a poorly figured lens, you'd see a streaky, distorted pattern. So when you look at these distant galaxies, you see some of them which are in the form of these arcs. So these are very distant galaxies, distorted and magnified. And this is a marvellous uh, vindication of one of the consequences of Einstein's theory, which is that gravity bends light. But this is also one of the best bits of evidence for dark matter, because you can work out how much stuff does there have to be in this cluster of galaxies to produce this conspicuous distortion. And the answer is about five times more than the gas and stars that you see. So this is one of the lines of evidence, and there are others that in our universe, there's not just gas and stars, but the so-called dark matter, which is probably some other kind of particles made in the Big Bang and left over, which have no electric charge and don't interact very much, but exert a gravitational force. Now, having talked about the uh, um, early stage of the universe, the next question you might ask is, what's the future? Is it going to go and expand forever, or is it going to recollapse? Uh, that's symbolized here with three options. If time, time is measured upwards and the universe is expanding, but will it go on expanding forever or will it recollapse? Now, people for a long time debated this. There wasn't very much evidence. Um, uh, if the density of the universe was very high, you might imagine gravity, where everything pulls and everything else would slow it down and we'd recollapse to a big crunch. The two other options, one is that it might go on expanding forever as a slow and slow rate. The other option is that it might speed up. Now, if you'd asked most people to bet a few years ago, I think they would have bet on the middle one. They would have said, well, we've got all these atoms, we've got this dark matter, and that is slowing down the expansion, but it didn't seem there was enough to bring the expansion to a halt. However, Astronomers had a big surprise about five years ago. Uh, they found that the expansion was actually speeding up, not slowing down, rather like the, uh, the right-hand picture there. And that was a surprise, because it indicated that there was some extra force which was overwhelming gravity on the scale of the entire universe. Some sort of repulsive force, where everything pushes away from everything else. Some energy or tension latent even in empty space itself which we don't notice because it's uh, such a dilute force and is dominated by gravity in the Earth and the solar system, even in the galaxy, but dominates on the very large scale. And, in fact, uh, when it was first uh, announced a few years ago, this was a cover of the magazine Science, which showed Einstein looking very cheerful. And the reason for that is that Einstein, a very long time ago, had speculated that there might be this extra force, he called it his cosmical constant, which caused this repulsion. Now, if I were to devise a logo for my research group, it would be this. It's an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. And I'd like to show this picture because it uh, symbolizes one of the things we learn from doing uh, astronomy and studying the universe, understanding our cosmic habitat, as it were. We learn about the interconnections of the very large and the very small. What this picture shows is, on the left, the micro world, the everyday scale, and the large scale. 
The left hand is the domain of the quantum, the right hand is the domain of gravity. And there are lots of links between left and right on this picture. The everyday world of people and mountains and the earth is dominated by atoms and the way they stick together to form molecules. Stars are nuclear fusion reactors. They are energized by nuclei. So there's a link between nuclei and, star, and, and stars. And the dark matter is probably some kind of subnuclear particles. This dark matter has galaxies again, so there's a link there. And we ourselves are midway between cosmos and microworld in scale. And we are clearly made of atoms. To understand us, we need to understand the atoms we're made of. But we also need to understand the stars. Because those atoms were themselves made in stars. Every atom in your body was formed from pristine hydrogen in a star which exploded more than five billion years ago, before our sun formed. And that atom, carbon, oxygen or iron, was made from hydrogen by nuclear fusion reactions. So to understand ourselves, we must understand the stars. Now the two great achievements of 20th century science were the quantum theory, the world of the micro world, and Einstein's theory, which gives a deep understanding of gravity. Quantum theory on the left, Einstein on the right. But, as I'm sure you know, one of the great pieces of unfinished business for 21st century science is that there's no unification between Einstein's theory and the micro world. Einstein's theory is not a quantum theory. Um, and in fact, Einstein never liked quantum mechanics at all. And so, we don't have a unified theory of the very large and the very small. Now, for most of the time, that doesn't matter. Because a chemist doesn't worry about gravity between individual atoms. And if you're an astronomer thinking about the orbits of planets, you don't worry about the quantum fuzziness in those orbits. But, going back to what I said earlier about the very beginning of the universe, one of the reasons why we can't dogmatically say what it was like at the very beginning is that when the universe was very, very dense, quantum effects could, as it were, shake the entire universe. And so, to understand that, we need a theory which reconciles Einstein's theory with the quantum theory. And that's, as it were, symbolized gastronomically at the top of this picture. We don't have the theory that does that. There are lots of ideas. Uh, for doing this string theory and all the rest. And just to mention string theory, um, to understand uh, um, nature of space time at the deepest level, we probably need to uh, envisage how, just as this table is made up of atoms, so empty space itself has some sort of grainy structure. Most people believe that if it does have that grainy structure, that structure is on a scale a billion, billion times smaller than atoms. And that uh, very t a tiny scale uh, may involve great complications, perhaps even extra dimensions. Perhaps every point in our space, if you looked at it very close up, would be some tightly wound origami of extra dimensions. It's symbolized there where every point is either a sphere or a torus. There's another very exciting idea, which is that perhaps the universe we observe, the vast domain which our telescopes can study out to 10 billion year, light years distance, or the region from which light has had time to reach us since the Big Bang, may be just some tiny bit of physical reality. There could be a lot more stuff far beyond our horizon where the light hasn't yet had time to reach us. Even more exotically, there could be other domains in extra dimensions. And uh, just to give an example, um, supposing uh, that you have a whole lot of um, ants crawling around on a sheet of paper, that's like their two-dimensional universe. They might be unaware of another population of ants on another parallel sheet of paper. And likewise, there could be another universe just a millimeter away from ours. But we're quite unaware of it, because that extra millimeter is measured in some four, fourth spatial dimension, and we're imprisoned in R3. So it could be that we will have to have a, a new leap, rather like the leap since Copernicus, where we've gone from um, one solar system to many, one galaxy to many, maybe we go from one big bang to many. But that is speculation. 
and that's why I put this hazard sign in, uh, because although uh, what I said about the universe back to a millisecond, you should, I think, take as seriously as what a geophysicist tells you about the early history of the Earth, when we get back to within the first millisecond, then all bets are off, because the physics is uncertain. I wanted to just to finish off by going back to this picture, and to say that we are determined both by atoms and stars, and we're mid midway between them. In fact, it would take as many human bodies to make up the sun as there are atoms in each of us. The geometric mean of the mass of a proton and the mass of a star is uh, about uh, 50 kilograms, and a factor of two of the mass of each of you. And the reason for that is not uh, too surprising, because clearly a structure uh, like a, a, an insect or a human, has to be very, very big compared to atoms. Now, layer upon layer of complicated structure. But then it gets too big, gets crushed by gravity, and gets simple again. So stars are actually simple, because gravity crushes them and doesn't allow any complicated structure. Well, just to lead into what uh, Chris is going to say, um, I, I just want to end up here with uh, uh, the other great scientific icon. Uh, this is um, the icon of complexity. Um, we have uh, Einstein, the icon of the very large and the very small, but the very complex. The bottom right picture is a big challenge, and this is uh, uh, Darwin and the famous final sentence of his Origin of Species. Um, and uh, um, the question is really whether the immense complexity which has happened from so simple a beginning here in Earth's biosphere uh, is something which uh, um, has happened elsewhere. And uh, uh, Chris is going to talk about this. Um, but uh, um, let me just give my perspective on what he's going to say. Um, because uh, we, we, we don't know, well, we, we don't know whether there's life out there, and we don't know uh, whether a simple life evolves into a terrorist of life. Um, and the question is, what would we like to find? Um, it would be great to discover some life out there, even great own terrorist of life. And it might be disappointing if all these searches fail. But there'll be a compensation. Because if it turns out that life, or at least intelligent life, is unique to this planet. It allows us to think of the Earth, small though it is, as cosmically important, the only place where this immense complexity has emerged. And moreover, it won't mean that life is forever unimportant, because the other thing we learn from astronomy, and which I've alluded to already, is the time lying ahead is much longer than the time that's elapsed up from now. Our sun is four and a half billion years old, the Earth may be 13 billion years old, uh, but uh, the, uh, our sun is less than halfway through its life, and the universe probably going to expand forever, getting ever colder, ever emptier. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but one point is that even our sun is less than halfway through its life. And sometimes you see people who talk about... Um, Sorry, I think I'm a bit more slow. Um, but uh, some people talk about what it would be like when we watch the sun flaring up and, uh, and dying and engulfing in the planets, vaporizing all life on Earth. That may happen. But any creatures who watch the demise of the sun six billion years from now won't be humans. They were as different from us as we are from bacteria. Because the time for Darwinian evolution between now and the end of the sun is even longer than the time it's taken for us to evolve from, from the primordial slime. And so, uh, that's why, if life is unique to the Earth, we should think of ourselves not as a culmination, but as merely some early stage, and the Earth as a place from which life can spread, perhaps through the galaxy and far beyond. So, our cosmic modesty uh, can uh, uh, be less acute if it turns out that the uh, SETI search fails. But let me now hand over to Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. I will keep my remarks brief. I'll say at the outset that I agree with Martin that we do not know currently whether life on Earth is unique or whether we're part of a vast biological universe. Uh, I'll discuss today briefly our efforts to answer that question. But the fact of the matter is that currently there is no strong evidence one way or the other. And I think it's very difficult uh, scientifically to say in advance uh, what the answer is likely to be. I think there's no question, though, that the question is... Uh, is fascinating and important. Let me come, uh, let me come towards, uh, towards home and begin in our own solar system. In fact, let me begin with our own Earth. 
One of the great accomplishments of the last few decades has been to place Earth and life on Earth into its solar system context. And that placement runs in both directions. And it's just been in the last 25 years that we've understood that the evolution of life on Earth has been strongly influenced by impacts on Earth by asteroids and comets, which depend on the, ultimately on the way the solar system formed. Similarly, our understanding of life on Earth strongly shapes the way we approach the search for life elsewhere in our solar system. Uh, to give just one example of that, but a very important example, in the last few decades, we've discovered uh, that there is a deep biosphere on the planet Earth, that there is a biosphere of microbes that extends kilometers down into the subsurface of the Earth. And the best estimates for the total mass, the total biomass of microorganisms extending several kilometers underneath the surface is that it is that is that that total biomass, and this is based on deep drill cores, that total biomass is comparable to the mass of all living things on the surface of the Earth, which is dominated by the forests. And once you have that picture of life on Earth, that there's as much stuff in microbes underground as in mass, as there is in all the trees on the surface of the planet, that gives you a new perspective on the prospects for life on other worlds in our solar system. And in particular, it makes thinking, it makes the prospects for life on Mars, which has a very harsh surface environment, but which almost certainly has liquid water in its subsurface, or on Jupiter's moon Europa, which has an ice cover uh, that's perhaps five to 10 kilometers thick, but underneath that ice cover has a liquid water ocean whose total volume is about twice that of all the water in the Earth's oceans. It makes prospects for life in those subsurface environments on those worlds, because there is liquid water on those worlds, seem more credible. That doesn't mean that there's life there. We're only going to know if there's life there by going there and looking for it. And with respect to Mars, there, we currently have a robust exploration program. With respect to Europa, we currently have essentially no exploration program. But I think they're, they're in sight in the next few decades, we can hope, uh, to have explored both those worlds. I should say one other thing about Mars. There's now evidence that liquid water has at least briefly flowed on the surface of Mars in the last several years. There are spacecraft orbiter pictures now that show an area of Mars where there is no uh, water cut channel, and then a few years later there is a water cut channel. So it seems even intermittently, evidently on about 100 locations on the surface of Mars, temporarily water emerges onto the surface. So I think there, there's hope uh, for what would likely be microbial life in our solar system, but we will only know the answer to that by having an active planetary exploration program. Let me leave our solar system now and look a bit farther out. 2,500 years ago, Aristotle, in his book On the Heavens, asked whether or not Earth was unique. Aristotle had a theoretical answer to that question, which was, yes, Earth has to be unique. Uh, his entire cosmology would have collapsed if uh, the answer had been different. The remarkable thing is that we're now, and by saying now, I mean in the next decade, uh, perhaps in the next few years, we're going to have an answer to that question for the first time in human history. Due to two missions, the European CORO mission and NASA's upcoming Kepler mission, we're, we should know, barring catastrophic spacecraft failure, we should know whether Earth is unique in our galaxy or whether Earth is common or the answer lies someplace in between. We will know the statistical frequency of Earth-sized worlds around other stars. We will also know the statistical distribution of the distance of those other Earths from their sun. So we'll be able to say something about whether what fraction of those planets the size of Earth, assuming any of them actually exist, we don't know that yet, what fraction of them are in the right distance from their sun for liquid water, say, to exist on their surfaces. In our solar system, if you're in as close to the sun as Venus, you've had a catastrophic greenhouse effect that has led to the closest thing to hell in our solar system. If you're as far away as Mars, or perhaps a little bit farther, the greenhouse effect collapses and you have a freeze-dried world. But there's this band, the so-called habitable zone, something of a misleading term because it only refers to surface conditions. But there's this band in which liquid water oceans can exist at the surface of a world. And we will, if, if things go well, we will know the frequency of earth sized worlds and their distances from their, uh, from their uh, suns, at least in a, a very close by area of our galaxy. That's a remarkable achievement, uh, a kind of, in my opinion, a kind of historical achievement in our understanding of how Earth fits in to our galaxy. Uh, and yet it is, I think, an indictment of the scientific community and perhaps other communities as well 
that I imagine that more individuals know the details of the uh, custody agreement between Brittany and KFED than are aware of those missions, and that, that the uh, epochal under changes in our understanding that we're about to see. Finally, let me look a bit farther out and talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. What I've talked about so far is a search for life that is almost in, uh, certainly a search for microbial life in our own solar system. A search for other Earths that is not a search for life. It's simply a search for plausible environments for life, but at least that's a step towards learning about the prospects for life. The last thing I want to touch on is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, an altogether different way to look for life, because it doesn't make the same assumptions about life being based on water or life being based on carbon. It makes, on the other hand, a tremendous assumption, which is that we will only detect life if it is technical and if it is broadcasting across interstellar distances. So it's an altogether different approach to the search for life that has embedded in it an assumption that at least some fraction of life in the, in the galaxy becomes technical and broadcasts across interstellar distances the way we are doing now, either inadvertently through television or occasionally uh, more powerfully with military radar or with a planetary radar or with intentional broadcasting, which has occurred on a few occasions. The, uh, sometimes people say that uh, we've searched and searched and searched for extraterrestrial intelligence. It, the searches have been going on now for about 40 years. We haven't found anything, and therefore, we must be alone. I only want to point out how primitive and limited those searches have been so far. The, uh, the dominant search, uh, led by the SETI Institute called Project Phoenix, at the world's largest radio telescope, has just completed. That search spent a decade looking at the 1,000 nearest stars like the sun. As Sir Martin said, there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy. So we searched almost no fraction of the galaxy. A, a tiny fraction of the galaxy has been searched so far. The SETI Institute is currently in the business of building a dedicated radio telescope for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's a revolutionary telescope design that will involve... The, there, was, there was a series of workshops to do this design. The, idea, the recognition was that Moore's Law and Computing was going to lead to so much computation power that instead of building a very large dish for sensitivity, we could construct 350 off-the-shelf six-meter dishes and link them together with computer power. Um, but that, would be, that would be made possible by the advance in uh, computation. And once that radio telescope is completed, uh, first of all, that telescope will be built for about half the price of a dish of comparable size. But once it's completed, we will be able to survey the million nearest sun-like stars uh, in the space of about a decade. Even then, that is a tiny fraction of the galaxy. So I think it will be a long time before we have empirical evidence about the uh, likelihood or not of other civilizations in our galaxy. But at least the search, assuming the funding is found, at least the search is beginning. Let me conclude then with a final remark that refers back to a comment by Sir Martin, which is that, in my opinion, human civilization is uniquely precious whether we are the only civilization in the galaxy, which is entirely possible, or we're part of a biological universe in which there are civilizations scattered across the galaxy. No other civilization is going to have had a Shakespeare. No other civilization is going to have had a Virginia Woolf. The list of names we could, we could list from cultures all across the planet is as long as any of our arms. Uh, and therefore, we are uniquely special and uniquely precious, regardless of what we find as we explore the universe. Thank you, and we're open now for questions and answers. And if there are none, we'll have to ask questions to each other. And that's very important. Please. What to your mind is, is the meaning of sustainability? Can I answer that? My name that? is Buek. Uh, yes. Yes. Sorry? My name is Buek. Okay, yes. Can I answer that by a, a sort of uh, cosmic vignette inspired by what Chris has just said? Um, supposing that some aliens were looking at our Earth and had been doing so not just for a few decades but for his entire history of four and a half billion years. Suppose if you look at this pale blue dot in the cosmos from a great distance. Over most of that immense time, change would be very gradual. Constants would have moved around, species would have evolved and become extinct. But then suddenly things would have started to change. 
vegetation would have started to change rapidly when human agriculture started. But then, in some tiny span of time, a century, one hundredth of one millionth of the age of the Earth, you'd have seen sudden changes. Sudden changes uh, in the vegetation, anomalous rises in the carbon dioxide, radio emission, anomalously bright, and for the very first time in the planet's history, projectiles leaving the surface of the Earth, going into orbit around it and going into space. Now, those external aliens watching us could have predicted that Earth would be doomed in another five or six million years when the sun dies, because they predicted this spasm of activity lasting one hundredth of one millionth of its history, less than halfway through its life. But then, if they were to go and watch it for another century, what would they see? Will this final spasm be answered by silence? Or will it become stabilized? Or will some of these uh, projectiles leaving the planet establish new colonies of life elsewhere? The answer to your question is the answer between those three. Will this spasm be followed by silence? Um, or will it be sustainable? Or will life continue on uh, other regions beyond the Earth? But this century, even in the cosmic time span, is very special. It's the first when one species, us, can determine the entire future of the planet. I, sh I should have uh, asked uh, anyone making a question or a comment to please identify themselves. Are there other comments or questions? Hi, I'm Joe Schoendorf from Excel Partners. How, how will we get to Europa with a robot? How long will it take? So the question is, how will we get to Europa with a robot and how long will it take? In um, 96 and 97, I chaired for NASA the science definition team for the Europa Orbiter mission, uh, which was about a year and a half exercise where we mapped out not only the science objectives, but working closely with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, worked through all of the astrodynamics and, on paper, the engineering for the mission. At that time, we were all depressed by the fact that we wouldn't get there until 2003. Uh, the mission wound up being canceled. Um, it was then briefly replaced by a very uh, ambitious mission relying on space nuclear reactors, which I declined to uh, take part in because I couldn't see basing of one of the most important objectives in the outer solar system on an as, on an as yet unproven technology. That mission also collapsed. Now NASA is starting a new science definition team to review the entire approach to exploring Europa. So there are two answers to your question. One is the bureaucratic answer. Uh, which is that after a decade, we were back to exactly where we were a decade ago. Um, and I'm declining to join the new science definition team out of some frustration. Uh, but I can give you what the answer was a decade ago. Um, the answer was that we wanted to get there quickly because it is perhaps the most exciting objective in the outer solar system. And we were therefore going to try to do it with as streamlined a mission as we could that wouldn't require gravity assists. It wouldn't require the spacecraft to fly around Venus to get a gravity boost out to the solar system because that would add years to the mission. With a chemical rocket, we could get there in about three years. It takes three years to get to Jupiter with a chemical rocket. We then were going to have to do a kind of tour of the moons that would take another year or two um, to get and then do a chemical burn to get into orbit around Europa. So think of, think of a five-year time scale from the time you launched the, uh, from the, time you launched the mission. Uh, depending on the details of the exact uh, configuration of the worlds involved. That's a, the low-end way of getting there, but the point is that it gets you there, um, and then you have some time in orbit to do a whole series of investigations before the incredible radiation environment, which exists at the surface of Europa, but won't exist in its ocean because it's shielded by the ice, before the incredible radiation environment shuts down your spacecraft. Please. <coughs> Are there uh, observable similarities or dissimilarities in the micro worlds that you describe, the extra dimensional worlds of biology, or in the schoolboy view of uh, electrons going around um, the nucleus and so forth, uh, and the macro world that you see as an astronomer? And ha have they been observable in, in, in any fashion? Um, you mean, is there some sort of nested hierarchy, uh, etc.? Um, I think probably not in a direct sense. I mean, the physics of the micro world is the sort of fuzzy physics of quantum 
theory, which isn't the same as in the uh, macro world. But I think what is important is that um, uh, if we are to understand the nature of space and time at the most fundamental level, uh, then that structure will be on a scale far, far smaller than atoms themselves, I think, uh, 20 powers of 10 smaller. And so that will be the next step down. Um, and whether there's the next step up, uh, whether there are uh, scales even larger than the volume we can observe with our telescopes, we, we don't know. So I think uh, each scale will be distinctive. Uh, it won't be a, um, a sort of um, a zoom in where everything repeats itself on a range of scales. Um, but there will be structure on these other scales we haven't yet probed. And, of course, one key question really is how far we will get with these theories. Uh, it's amazing, go back to Einstein, it's amazing that the human brain is matched, uh, not just to cope with the everyday world, but to devising theories that apply in these exotic regimes of the micro world and the cosmos. Um, we've got a long way, but uh, it could be that there is a theory, but it's beyond our grasp. That's a possibility. Are there questions or comments? Please, and please do identify yourself. Alan Kramer from California. Uh, you made a statement about the microbial life under the surface. Is there any knowledge about when that started, how quickly it spread, whether it was uniform or, or not? Thank you. The question concerns the microbial life beneath the Earth's surface and what do we know about when it started, how it spread, whether it's uniform, and so on. Um, let me answer that. Let me say one other thing I should have said in reply to the Europa question, which is that um, there are regions on the surface of Europa where it looks like liquid water from the subsurface has reached the surface. So we should be able to get knowledge about Europa's ocean without having to melt through 10 kilometers of ice. I should have made that clear. We, to, to, we should be able to learn about what's in the ocean without the very ambitious mission that would involve uh, somehow getting through kilometers and kilometers of ice. With respect to the Earth's, the Earth's biosphere, is fortunately easier to uh, sample. Um, our knowledge of it is still spotty. It is based on, on drill cores, and then one tries to extrapolate over the planet based on the different densities of microbes that exist in different kinds of rocks. So you have to estimate, you know, in this kind of rock, there, there are 100,000 microbes per cubic centimeter, and the amount of subsurface that's represented by that kind of rock at that depth. Uh, but those estimates have been done and published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. And you should view those numbers as uncertain, but the remarkable thing is that the number does come out to be about 10 to the 18 grams, about the same as the mass of the forest. We don't have a great deal of knowledge at all about what the history of that subsurface biosphere is. Um, there is a fraction of that biosphere, and this is especially interesting from the point of view of prospects for life else elsewhere. There is a fraction of the subsurface biosphere that seems to be entirely independent of surface conditions on the Earth. You might think that it's all independent of the surface conditions. It's living a kilometer underground. But in fact, even down there, much of the life depends ultimately on the production of oxygen at the surface, which is driven by photosynthesis. And if, uh, if the sun shut off, then that would be it. But there is a fraction of the subsurface biosphere that seems to be entirely independent of the production of oxygen or the production of organics by photosynthesis on the surface. So if the sun were to go out tomorrow, which astrophysically wouldn't happen, but if that were to happen, and the Earth froze over, because of the internal heat of the Earth, there would still be a region in the subsurface where liquid water was present and would be present for billions of years. And there would be, almost certainly, there would be an ecosystem that would continue to thrive at that depth. Uh, so, you know, there are some fraction of planets, for example, that have probably been thrown out of their solar systems altogether and sent off into interstellar space. Even some of those worlds might have very deep biospheres on them. One last comment about the timing. I mentioned in my brief remarks that the Earth had been bombarded by comets and asteroids. One of the great scientific achievements of the Apollo program, but also the Soviet Luna missions, the Soviet program returned several rock samples from the Moon has been to reconstruct the bombardment history of comets and uh, asteroids in the early solar system. And we understand that in the first 700 million years or so of solar system history, the bombardment due to asteroids was literally exponentially greater than it is today. If you take that seriously, and you, you have to because the evidence is there, and ask what are the implications of that for the early Earth, you discover that this is a statistical comment now because there's no direct evidence. It's based on an extrapolation from the cratering record on the moon. The Earth was probably subjected to a handful of impacts early on that
that were so energetic that they would have boiled off our entire ocean. That, that may have sterilized the entire planet. You need an asteroid that's several hundred kilometers across to do that. That could have sterilized the entire planet. But if life had first originated on Earth and evolved down to these subsurface niches, the uh, heat shock from, from boiling off the ocean only extends half a kilometer down. So life could have remained quite happy down at a kilometer or two, despite those truly catastrophic events at the surface. And in that sense, life may have passed through a bottleneck, where, at the, where the surface was the last place you wanted to be. And there would have been good evolutionary reasons to get as deep as, as, deep as you could, as fast as you could. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Excuse me. In your search for... C could you please identify... I'm sorry. Michael Zawi, uh, I'm from France. In your search for life, what conclusions or thoughts can you give us about the origin of our lives? Why don't we both touch on that? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm bound at a more basic level of crisis on this subject. Uh, because uh, I think uh, uh, even here on Earth, uh, we don't know how life began. Uh, we understand how evolution uh, proceeded in our time, but we don't know the very beginning. Um, and uh, perhaps we will understand this either by uh, um, pure thought, by computer simulations, or by new evidence. But obviously, if we understood how life had begun on Earth, that would give us a clue to where to look for it elsewhere and how likely it was to have evolved elsewhere. And it does surprise me how little research has been done on this uh, uh, problem. It's an example in science, actually, of uh, uh, very often um, everyone is aware of what the important problems are, uh, but, you so but you spend your life trying to solve not the most important problem, but the most important problem which you think you can solve. It's a much more uh, limited subset. Uh, and I think many people have, uh, have veered away from the big problem, the origin of life. But that's uh, my inexpert view. Chris does know a good deal more about this than me. Thank you. I'll, I'll only add a, a couple of remarks. And the question is, what, what have we learned about the origin of life from the search for life? Um, there is, a, as Martin said, a surprisingly small amount of funding for these questions. A lot of it has come in the United States from NASA's astrobiology program which funds a lot of work related to simply the origin of life on Earth as such. The first thing to say is, as Martin has already alluded to, that, there is, that the question of the origin of life is distinct from the question of habitability for life. So we can look at the ocean on Europa and say that it appears to be habitable for life as we know it, but that doesn't mean that it was ever appropriate for the origin of life to take place there. The only place we know the origin of life evidently has occurred is on, is on the early Earth. It seems that that happened early on Earth because we have a variety of fossil evidence that is strong back to, well, it's very strong back to three billion years ago. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old. The evidence for life on Earth is very strong back to three billion years ago. I think strong with some concern at 3.5 billion years ago. And there is a wild controversy raging over purported evidence for life at 3.8. But the suggestion is that life goes back a very long way. Microbial life goes back a very long way on Earth. Our knowledge of the origin of life has been certainly strongly informed by exploration of the solar system. I've already mentioned the impact environment. It appears life must have originated not in, a kind, in the kind of peaceful, quiet pond that Darwin envisioned, but in, in fact, a violent, impact-ridden environment, which is a remarkable thing to say. Uh, we've learned through astrophysics that the conditions on Earth for the origin of life have to have been very different than the conditions on Earth today. Carl Sagan identified something in the early 70s called the early faint sun paradox. He did that by bringing together knowledge of the evolution of stars like the sun with knowledge of the greenhouse effect. The sun was dimmer four billion years ago at the time of the origin of life than it is today. That has to have meant that either the Earth was frozen over and looked a lot like Europa. So in that sense, Europa provides a model for a potential early Earth, or there was a much more powerful greenhouse effect on Earth that somehow persisted even though the sun was much dimmer. In fact, Titan, the big moon of Saturn in our solar system, provides one model for what a world like that might have looked like four billion years ago. So our understanding of the early Earth can take advantage of these analog worlds in the solar system that may resemble what at least different models for the early Earth looked like. I'll make just one final comment. 
there are a set of theories now that have to do, a set of theories for the origin of life on early Earth. Some of them are deep origin theories that suggest the origin of life didn't take place at the surface where you would have all of the energy from the sun and abundant liquid water, but, but took place somehow in the subsurface. We have a little bit of information on that by looking uh, at meteorites, which came from the interior of certain large asteroids. Certain large asteroids used to have liquid water in them. We have direct evidence from the chemistry of the meteorites that liquid water used to be present. They have minerals that can catalyze chemical reactions, and they have abundant organic molecules, molecules based on carbon. It is fascinating that when you look at those meteorites, you see, beyond some simple amino acids, you see almost no further steps toward the origin of life. And that seems to be telling us something by exclusion about environments where it may be very difficult to originate life. So by exploring the solar system, we're certainly getting hints. But Martin is absolutely right. This is a very difficult problem. There is remarkably little funding available for pursuing it. Uh, in fact, it would be difficult right now to give, um, uh, unless somebody was a, an absolutely exceptional student, it would, we'd have to have a question of, about how responsible it was to encourage a student to go in to Origins of Life as a graduate student, simply from the basis of their career. Would there be funding for them to support a scientific career? Jonathan Freed from Canada. For us non-scientists in the crowd, we tend to think of microscopes and telescopes. You tend to explain things to us in terms of observable things, and yet you talk about computations and extrapolations. Can you explain the relative importance of the observable versus the theoretical mathematical in, in uh, moving forward? Um, just two points. Uh, first, um, all the advances essentially, in our understanding of the cosmos, have derived from advancing technology, uh, going into space, new telescopes, sense faint light, etc. Pure thought wouldn't get us very far. Uh, we're no wiser than Aristotle was. So it's technology which drives these scientific explorations. Um, of course, the role of computer simulations is especially important in uh, sciences where we can't directly do experiments. Uh, we can't... Um, <coughs> crash two galaxies together, or make a star explode. But we can, in our virtual world of the computer, do these simulations and uh, compare what we see uh, with what's up there in the sky. So certainly, uh, in uh, understanding how um, stars and planets form, how our universe evolves, how we can get from a big bang to uh, uh, a cosmic vista like what we see around us, computer simulations have played an increasing role especially in the last decade when they've had the power to do sort of uh, really good simulations. So computer simulations are crucial, and I hope they will be even more so in the next decade. Thank you. If there are final questions or comments, we'll take them all together, and Martin and I can make any last remarks, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Are there any final comments or questions? There's one here, and I don't see any others, so this will be the final comment. A quick question in terms of the, uh, the search for life, and I guess it's, it's radio signals and transmissions you're looking for. What are the limits of sensitivity? And also, if you flip that around and imagine that someone out there may be looking for us, what would be the limits uh, that way as well? So the question concerns limits of sensitivity in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I think the, uh, m the most straightforward way of explaining that is the sensitivity of our current searches. One can always trade off the time one spends collecting a signal. Uh, against uh, the size of your radio telescope dish. Uh, Project Phoenix, which has just recently concluded at Ar the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, the largest dish in the world, um, had a sensitivity that, let me give you a few milestones. Arecibo can also broadcast. It's used, for example, for planetary radar. If Arecibo were broadcasting, and if there were another Arecibo elsewhere in the galaxy and it were broadcasting, if it happened to be pointed directly at Earth, which is extremely unlikely, but if it did, we could detect another Arecibo halfway to the center of the galaxy. The difficulty is that that's essentially the most powerful uh, radar signal the Earth can send out into the cosmos. Um, and what our civilization is doing primarily is leaking television signals and other signals which may not put our best foot forward out into the galaxy. <laughs> and in that case, even with another Arecibo, we would not detect our own leakage uh, past the nearest star. So currently we can't see what's sometimes called leakage. We are in effect looking for either intentional transmissions or transmissions that are more powerful 
than the current one, uh, current ones that the Earth, uh, that the Earth uh, broadcasts. Uh, if the, a long-term project, meaning perhaps in the next few decades for the Earth, is something called the Squared Kilometer Array, a much larger radio telescope, and in fact the, the telescope array that the SETI Institute is building is a leading contender that could be duplicated to ultimately construct the Squared Kilometer Array. If that array was constructed, we would be in the position of beginning to detect leakage from at least uh, the nearest stars. But civilizations would have to be enormously prevalent in the galaxy, which I, there's a personal prejudice, it's based on very little evidence, uh, but I, I find that very hard to envision uh, for, that, for that kind of leakage to, uh, to be successful. Um, of course, if we detected a signal which was um, artificial, like say a string of prime numbers or something like that, um, then of course it would, it would imply that uh, concepts of logic and physics weren't unique to the hardware and human skulls. But it wouldn't imply anything like us out there. Indeed, the signal could be coming from some, uh, some computer that was made by some uh, organic life that had become long extinct. So uh, uh, what we would be looking for would be something that's a subset of life that's uh, like us in the sense of understanding logic and physics, but maybe very different in other respects. And of course, the other um, obvious point is if we were to make contact, then there's no scope for snappy repartee, as it were, because uh, uh, the signals would take uh, decades to get to even uh, uh, a nearby star. Um, but I think, just as a final thought, um, uh, what's going to be the future of, uh, of life starting from the Earth? Um, go back to Darwin. Um, we have as much time lying ahead as has been up till now. Uh, so what's going to happen? Uh, will there be post-human life on Earth? Uh, will life from the Earth uh, spread beyond and diversify uh, to adjust um, either by natural selection or probably by genetic modification to alien habitats? Uh, or will some kind of silicon-based life, life take over? Uh, I think uh, it is amazing to believe that we have as much time ahead as up till now. And moreover, evolution is now potentially taking place, not on the very slow time scale of Darwinian natural selection, but on a much faster time scale uh, of uh, technology and genetic modification, etc. So uh, um, there is a tremendous potential in the next few centuries, and that also makes us wonder about all the amazing things that might already be out there if Earth is not unique in having developed a complex biosphere. Thank you, Sir Martin, and thanks to all of you, and this session is closed.